These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There's a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos.htm or you can just use the link in the info box. Thank you. We've been focusing on aldehydes and ketones. And what's the main thing we've been focusing on about aldehydes and ketones? H have we been treating the aldehydes and ketones as electrophiles or as nucleophiles? Um, as electrophiles. Right. And, and which is the atom in the, in the molecule that's the electrophilic? Uh, <coughs> the uh, carbon. That's right. Which carbon? The carbonyl carbon. The carbonyl carbon. That's a good name for this carbon, the carbonyl carbon. And we need to have a reason why that's electrophilic. Can you remember one of the reasons why the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic? Because the, the uh, elect or oxygen is more electronegative, so it's pulling the electron density towards it, making the carbonyl carbon uh, the delta positive. That's right. It has that delta positive charge. One of the reasons why the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic is that it has the delta positive charge. That's the reason we mainly focused on. I don't know if you remember, there was one other reason we've discussed for why the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. Do you remember the other reason besides? So one reason is that the oxygen is more electronegative, which is making this delta positive. Do you remember what the other reason is for why it's, for why the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic? Mm, I don't know. Okay. Well, let's try drawing another resonance structure of uh, this compound. Remember, that's one of the big habits that we have to get into this term, explaining things not just in terms of sterics and not just in terms of electronegativity, but also in terms of resonance. So let's use electron pushing arrows to draw the other resonance form. Good. And you correctly got the charges right in that resonance structure. Now this resonance structure gives us another reason why the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. Do you see what I mean by that? How does that resonance structure give us a reason why the carbonyl carbon would be electrophilic? Well, now you actually have the separation of charges mm -hmm. as opposed to like um, actually, uh, like a delta positive, you actually have a positive on the carbonyl carbon. A full positive, that's the key. We have a separation of charges. Most important, that puts a full positive charge on this carbon. It always comes back to explaining things in terms of positives and negatives. That's really the key to the whole course, keeping track of the positives and negatives. This resonance structure would indicate a delta positive on this carbon, which would tend to indicate the carbon is electrophilic. But this resonance structure indicates a full positive charge, uh, plus an incomplete octet on this carbon, which would also intend to indicate that it's uh, electrophilic. So these are both good arguments for why this would be an electrophilic carbon. I just wanted to emphasize this because, as I think we've talked about in a previous session, the theme for this whole term is using resonance as part of our explanations. Again, not, uh, you're probably already in the habit of using steric hindrance or electronegativity as part of your explanations, but now we have to always be looking to see if there's other resonance structures that we can use to explain things. Well, here we have another resonance structure that helps us to understand why this carbon is electrophilic. And then we know that there are at least four different categories of nucleophilic attack on that electrophilic carbonyl carbon. And we've talked about some of those categories together and the other ones you might have been you might, are watching about in the videos. So now we're going to move on to something a little different. Now we're going to see how an aldehyde or a ketone could act like a nucleophile. Again, what we've done in the last couple of sessions is focus on how the aldehyde of the ketone could act like an electrophile, but now we're going to be focusing on how it could act like a nucleophile. Well, it's not this carbon that's going to be nucleophilic. There must be some other atom that's going to be nucleophilic. The oxygen. Or, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the alpha carbon. How did you know that? Uh, the videos. Oh, really? I didn't think that the videos had gotten to that yet. Okay, good. Oh, at the end of the first video, there's that whole little session. Good. I'm glad that you had a chance to watch that. Um, that, I, that we, um, that's kind of like chapter two in the second language book. It does a good review of, of mechanisms in general. Okay, well, it's good that you remembered that. 
Yes. So um, now there is an argument for thinking that the oxygen might be nucleophilic. However, you're not going to learn about those reactions in this introductory course. So in this introductory course, you're going to learn about how the alpha carbon can be nucleophilic. And you might have already seen then, how, how do we know which one is the alpha carbon? This is, I'm oh, sorry. It's adjacent to the carbonyl carbon. That's right. This is not the alpha carbon. That's a little bit different from how we would name alcohols. In an alcohol, the carbon connected to the oxygen is called the alpha carbon, as well as the alcohol carbon. However, this is not the alpha carbon, this is the alpha carbon. And just to continue, this would be what we would call beta carbon. What comes after beta? Alpha, beta, gamma. So this would be the gamma carbon. I guess if there was another carbon, we could call that delta, but uh, I guess we don't have to get too far carried away with the <laughs> Greek alphabet. But we're definitely going to be talking a lot about alpha and pretty soon about beta carbons as well. And actually, we might even get as far as the gamma carbon. Now, it's perfectly possible you could have more than one alpha or beta carbon or a gamma. For example, this is an alpha carbon over here as well. That's going to be one of our important skills now, then, identifying alpha carbons. It shouldn't be too hard, though. It's a carbon that's connected to a carbonyl carbon. Well, as you are correctly remembering, it's going to turn out that the alpha carbons can be nucleophilic. Now, they're not really nucleophilic in the aldehyde or the ketone, but the point is we can make them nucleophilic. Well, then the question is, what do we have to do to make the alpha carbon nucleophilic? You might have also briefly seen that at the end of that video series. I don't know if you, if you remember, what do we do to make the alpha carbon nucleophilic? What do we have to treat this aldehyde with to make the alpha carbon nucleophilic? We didn't talk about that too much in the video. So the key thing we need to treat this with, huh? good, you remember? That's right, we need to treat it with the base. That's right. Side here. Well, let's see if we can show the mechanism for what happens when we treat this with a base. It's going to, um, is it, it's okay if we draw in our hydrogen? Yeah, in fact, uh, we really have to do that. Good. Now I'm going to show another way we could show the same reaction that's equivalent and, in my opinion, more useful. We can show the base taking the proton, and now we have to do something with these electrons. But now instead of putting the electrons into a pi bond here, I'm just going to draw an arrow like this. Well, what does this arrow indicate is happening to the electrons in this bond now? It's a lone pair on carbon. That's right. Now, we don't generally draw lone pairs in organic chemistry, so the only indication of that is going to be that this carbon will now have a negative charge because it's at the final head. In this way of drawing it, the oxygen was at the final head, so the oxygen got the negative charge. But in this way of drawing the same reaction, it is the hydrogen, I, I'm sorry, it's this alpha carbon at the head, so the uh, alpha carbon gets the negative charge. Now this is an issue, a frustrating issue that we talked about last time, which is that oftentimes in this term there's going to be more than one legal way to write a mechanism. So sometimes it's hard to tell whether if, if, you have, if what you have is different from the instructor or the answer key, it's hard to tell whether it's right or wrong. And the reason there can be more than one legal way is because there's going to be multiple resonance structures. And remember, it's legal to use any resonance structure as your answer because they're all equivalent. Well, these two pictures are really just resonance structures of each other. And you can see that here because the only real difference between these two pictures is the location of the electrons inside this molecule. 
Here, we're just putting the pair of electrons um, on this carbon, whereas in this picture, we're putting the pair of electrons in a pi bond and moving this pi bond over here. But those are only differences about moving the pi electrons around inside a molecule. Well, what do we call it when we're moving pi electrons around inside a molecule? Resonance. And e any of those resonance structures are considered equivalent to each other. You can certainly see that here. You can certainly see that we could take this picture and draw another resonance structure of it that looks like this. And then that would just give us this picture here, which shows that this picture and this picture really are equivalent to each other. 